Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name, as Abby said earlier on, is Connor McCarthy. I'm over from the machine learning team in London, and for the last six months, I've been developing the machine learning toolkit, which I'm going to present today. Uh, so I suppose a bit of history on our machine learning activities to date. So the team was started about 18 months ago, and a year ago, um, the team released uh, KDB and Python integration um, through Embed Pi. Uh, so embed Pi essentially brings everything that you could want from Python into your Q environment. Uh, so you can basically uh, do any sort of machine learning or plotting or anything you want uh, with your Q data without having to, to download it and bring it, bring it out of your environment. Um, and then we have JupyterQ, which I'm going to use a little bit later on, as well as with embed Pi um, for my demonstration. Uh, so I'll show you that then. Um, and then six months ago, KX25, we announced the release of our natural language processing library. Um, it's kind of a bit of a diversion away from our, our usual structured data. So it's, it's taking an unstructured data set generally and uh, doing stuff like tokenization, lemmatization on your data to allow you to, to do analysis on it in queue. And then our, our newest release is the, I suppose the initial release of our machine learning toolkit so the toolkit comprises of two sections currently, but that'll be expanded out over time. So we have first uh, general use machine learning functions. Um, I'll talk a little bit about them later on, but my uh, presentation is gonna largely uh, deal with the fresh algorithm. So the fresh algorithm is a, is a feature extraction algorithm. So it's for taking your structured data and compressing it down so it can be used in machine learning applications. It's Slightly uh, simpler than Mark's neural networks, but it's along the same kind of idea. You're trying to get as much information from the data as you can without having to use something that's as complicated as a neural network. So this is all fully documented. It's available on Code.kx, and it's free for anyone to use. So you can download it from GitHub. Um, if there's any problems with anything on it, uh, drop us an email, um, and I'll have to fix them. So uh, what's in our utility functions? So the functions are contained in two namespaces. We have a, currently, we have a .ml namespace and a .ml.util namespace. They're both slightly different. ML, the ML namespace contains kind of the, I suppose, the, the basic uh, building blocks of what you'd use in machine learning. So all your accuracy scores are in that. Um, stuff like your validation functions are all there. Uh, and then. In the util namespace, we have a kind of more tailored um, functionality. So stuff like uh, tailored filling of data in machine learning applications, um, as opposed to, I suppose, in a lot of financial applications where you just forward fill your data. It might be pertinent um, in some cases to median fill your data, linearly interpolate your data. Um, so you can do all of that kind of on the fly by modifying a dictionary. It'll default automatically to forward fill your data, but um, you can change it. Um, and then we have cross-entropy functions, polynomial feature creation, um, and stuff like that. All this is going to be expanded over time, so we're going to continue developing things, uh, stuff like cross-validation functions, kind of Q, Q versions of them, um, and all of it will be released to the public. OK, so what's FRESH? FRESH is uh, feature extraction and scalable hypothesis testing. Um, what's that mean? Uh, Basically, it's a library of functions that lets you gain insights into your structured data. Um, so based on what's called an ID column, um, so it could be your date, it needs to have kind of unique, a unique character to it. So if you're talking about financial data, you might be trying to gain insights into your data based on the date or a specific hour. Um, so it applies these functions to your data and basically concatenate, concatenates it down. I'll, I'll show you what I mean in a second. Um, so this allows for hundreds of thousands of features to be produced. Um, so it's all wrapped basically in two functions. There's, there's one function that does the feature extraction, one that does the feature selection. Um, don't worry, there is a lot of work behind it. I didn't do nothing for six months. Uh, so the functions within the library are in uh, the .ml.fresh namespace. Um, and we have three notebook examples currently and a console version which you can use. Um, Again, they should all run, provided you have JupyterQ and EmbedPy. Uh, okay, so feature extraction. I don't know. Yeah, it's fine. 
Um, so feature extraction is a uh, production of derived features um, from input data, uh, which is then passed to a machine learning algorithm. When you're talking about stuff like time series data, it's quite difficult to, um, to pass that a lot of the time to machine learning algorithms because what you're generally doing is you're trying to predict on one target, but in the case of time series, you have lots and lots of data. Um, so what the feature extraction is doing, essentially, is concatenating down. Um, you can see there's uh, unique dates there, that's stock market data uh, per hour. So it's concatenating it down and applying functions to, to each of the, the columns that we want. So in this case, we have open, high, uh, low, and close prices. Um, so you can see on the keyed side of the table, there's uh, just one date per, uh, per row. So it allows you to use less complex machine learning algorithms um, rather than neural networks, which would kind of generally be how you deal with time series data a lot of the time. Um, and difficulties often arise, obviously, because, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, so we're essentially reframing the problem. Um, we're not doing the extraction kind of under the hood. That's all being done. Um, it's Yeah, it's all being done, and you can see everything that's being done. But a lot of the time, the extracted features obviously aren't going to be useful. So this is a, basically a wrapped um, production of features. So you're not going to need, say, a high price. You might not need to use your high price for your, uh, um, for your predictions um, in certain circumstances. So we uh, produce a couple of statistical tests on them. So if our target's binary um, or real, we, uh, we apply different tests based on whether the features are real or binary. Um, and what this does basically is it simplifies the model, so it makes them easier to interpret. You can see what is being passed to your model that's being deemed or statistically significant based on the p-values that are being passed to it. Um, it shortens the time that you need to train the model because you don't need to do it on um, kind of obsolete or non-useful data. Um, and it reduces our variance in our data set, so it stops overfitting, which, which Mark talked about a little bit earlier. So now I'm going to do the scary part, which is uh, giving a live demo. Uh, so, oh, that's not what I want. Okay, so. Okay, so I'll explain what the problem is first, because it's, it's not a financial problem. This kind of stuff isn't... Uh, isn't always well suited to being uh, past financial data. So what I'm going to be doing is basically wafer detection. It's a manufacturing example. So in manufacturing, when you're producing something like, in this case, hard drives, um, a lot of the time you're not going to be able to figure out whether the hard drives themselves are faulty until the very end, until uh, the end of production. But through the course of um, the entire production cycle, you uh, have sensor data. So at your initial point, when you're producing all of your your wafers, you get kind of uh, you get information on how it was produced. So you're gonna have voltmeters or stuff like that. Um, so if I know what the sensors were doing at the initial point that I was producing them, and what the outcome was at the end, then I could potentially use the sensor. Uh, data to predict whether um, the wafers are going to be abnormal or not at the end point. So what I do is load in the library. Okay, so and my data. So the data is already split into to targets and uh, the data itself. So I'll show you what it looks like. So you can see that the time, in this case, the time column is um, yeah, there's a time column which are equispaced uh, times, and we have an identifying column which has, in this case, you can see it's it's just a random number, but there's there's lots and lots of different uh, different IDs within the data set. Um, so I have that, and I have my targets. So the targets in this case, zero are abnormal wafers being produced, and one are the normal wafers. So you can see that it's it's quite a skewed data set, so we have about 90% in our uh, normal, which is what you'd expect in a manufacturing example. If you weren't making more than you were, or more good ones than bad ones, then you'd have something more wrong. So what 
we do is I define the uh, functions that I'm going to be applying. In this case, we're uh, only applying what are called single input features. Uh, so what these are ones that only take the time series data as uh, input. Um, they don't take hyperparameters. So stuff like Fourier transforms aren't being applied here. Um, so these are some of the ones that are under the hood. So you have stuff like uh, the number of values within your data set that were above the mean, um, whether it was duplicates in the data, um, whether it was a max duplicate, and, uh, and so on. So then from my, I'll go back up, from my initial inputs, I'm going to now produce the, the features themselves. So this is all wrapped in a function which has a long name. Uh, .ml.fresh.createFeatures. So what that input or takes as input are the data itself, um, the identifying column that you're using, the number of leading uh, columns in your, or sorry, the columns in your data that you want to actually apply the functions to. So in this case, I don't want to apply it to the first column in the data, and then the functions that are being applied, so the, the single input functions that um, were defined above. So hopefully this shouldn't take too long to run. So that's it done there. It doesn't seem very uh, very impressive. But uh, what that's after doing is applying about 50 functions uh, to the data set um, and giving me information uh, based on what I was uh, what I was given it. And then we want to get the significant features like I said before. So what this is this function does, um, which is here is it basically it takes our our data or yeah it takes um the created features that we had before and the target vector and uh calculates the p values associated with the the produced produced features um when compared to the targets so if we run that that runs now they're the same because the absolute energy is is important um so i can show you that the the reason that, well, that they are different by taking the number of columns uh, within the data. So we've <coughs> reduced the number of features that are being um, calculated on from, or that were produced from 217 to 146, um, because 146 of them were deemed to be um, important enough to, to keep. They reached the threshold set by a uh, statistical test. So then we prepare our data. So we take the we flip, basically flip the data um, and get a feature matrix. And then I have a benchmark model that um, I set. So if it's sensor data, there is potential that, um, or yeah, if it's, if it's sensor data and I'm talking about getting an abnormal feature from it, there, one likely thing would be that if the average value, the average value from that sensor um, at a specific time peaks, then I might be, um, kind of breaking, basically breaking the uh, the production. So I've just taken the average of each of the features as a, as a, um, as a benchmark. So init init ooh, initiate my machine learning algorithm, uh, which in this case is a random cl forest classifier. Um, so it's basically a load of decision trees, um, 500 of them. Um, and then I'm going to train my model. So what this is doing is using one of the functions from the uh, machine learning toolkit, so the train test split. Um, it's a seeded version of it, so that I'm setting where uh, the data is being being split uh, based on the current time. So if I do that, I'm gonna then predict um, my test set or predict the values from my test set um, and fit them, and they're all using embed pi. Uh, so if I run that, shouldn't take too long. Yeah. So. In the first instance, the first one here is uh, after all the feature extraction has been done. So there's about, I think there's about 300, uh, oh no, there's not, there's 239 um, values within the, the test set, and it's misclassified one of them. So it's pretty good, it's less than 0.5%. Uh, or less than 0.5%. Um, And then when I compare it to what I've set as my benchmark model, which only had two, which is unfortunate because it's usually more. Uh, um, yeah, you can see that it, it, it beat the benchmark. Um, actually, run it again and see if I can improve on that. Because yeah, okay. Oh well, <laughs> three and four. 
See, this is the problem with live demos. Uh, but that potentially, if you're talking about a manufacturer that's producing millions and millions of um, of hard drives per year, then it's it's not actually that much of a problem. Um, and then I can display the confusion matrix using a uh, function and using matplotlib. So um, I'm gonna command minus. So in this case, we're seeing what our predicted label was in each case. So 206 of them that were normal were deemed to be normal as well. And uh, the 30 of them that were abnormal were deemed abnormal. Um, our two outliers are this one on the top right and the one on the bottom left. Um, but you can see that it, it's actually less, it's actually more, it's actually okay um, because the ones that were deemed to be abnormal were actually fine. So if you got a, a engineer to go and look at them themselves, um, they'd be able to see that it was the um, the uh, that the wafers were fine. Um, so they could just be brought back into production. Um, so really, you'd only throw one away, and that'd be okay. Yeah, that's that's really all I have. Uh, well, all that I'm going to show because uh, we're a little bit short on time. Um, but if anybody has any questions, then that's fine. I think I have about two minutes if anybody has any questions. Yeah, hi. How do you set your probabilities? The, which ones? The ones from? Where you went from a high number of columns to a level like 146. Oh, right, okay. Uh, yeah, so there's three statistical tests that um, can be applied to the data um, based on whether the target vector is binary or whether it's real. So in the case where they're um, binary, there's specific, uh, the specific functions that are applied to them uh, to test uh, essentially how statistically significant they are. So we're calculating in each case p-values. Um, and once those p-values are gotten, we apply uh, what's called a benjamini hochberg test, um, which sets a threshold for the false discovery rate um, within the data and basically tries to match or get close to that, tries to beat it, really. Um, Is there a way to change the p-value? Uh, not really, because the, the p-value the would just be a, it's kind of inherent into, it's inherent with kind of comparing the the features to the targets themselves. It's just based on kind of variance within the data, I think. Um, there are different uh, versions, and it'll come out with the next the next release, I think, of uh, choosing what features uh, you apply. So there's ones which have kind of K. So you can choose the, the top 15 features if you want it, so one that does that, and then one that takes a percentile um, amount of the data, so the top 10% of your data, or p-values within your data would be would be chosen as well. Good. Thanks.